Join me every month for the inspiration to find your finish line. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Find Your Finish Line. I'm your host, Mike Riley, and this podcast is not only about you being able to find your finish line at a race or an event, but in life. I'll talk to people from all walks of life who have jumped over a lot of hurdles, gone through those walls, gotten to the other side, and hopefully their stories and their inspiration will help inspire you to find your next finish line. By the way, we're in the holiday season. People are asking me, Mike, I want to get your book. Go to MikeRiley.net. Uh, send me a question and everything. I'll give you an address that you can get the book at. Uh, you can buy it on Amazon. That's probably the fastest way right now and uh, get it there. Also, my video recording. You can go to MikeRiley.net, order a personal video recording that I'll do for a family or a friend on behalf of you and send it to them for the holidays. That's always a cool deal. And for the first time ever, next year, 2024, I have advertising, two advertising slots open on the podcast. So if you're interested, just send me a message to Mike at MikeRiley.net. My guest today, you know, when I put together lists of guests to have on the show, I want to make sure it's someone who's going to inspire you. I don't really want to go after stories that uh, are commonplace. And sometimes those stories are tough because someone could have an affliction, someone could go through a trauma in their life, and I'm not doing that to accentuate the bad of it. I'm doing it so that the messages and the things that they learn can help teach you along your life's journey. My guest today will help you do that. Her name is Sarah Fick. She's a mom of three, business entrepreneur. She's competed in over 50 Ironman events doing her first Kona back in 2003. Sarah, how are you today? I'm good. I'm really good. I'm happy to be here. As you know. Oh, good. Just thrilled. I, I, I and I'm I'm excited to have you. Thank you, Sarah. I yeah. ask every guest the same first question oh, yeah. on the podcast. What kind of workout did you get in today? Okay, so the only thing I've done today is walk. I did a dog walk. Now don't say don't say morning. don't say only <laughs> don't say only. It's okay. <laughs> Okay. Well, today I walked, but I'm going to do a swim later today. I'm on a, I'm on a taper. Next weekend, I'll be at Half Ironman Florida, which I saw you at last year. So you're going to, all right, good for you. Good for yeah. you. And you, you uh, I'm going to start right with you. You're going through a very difficult challenge. You have been for a while uh, that we're going to talk about. You're battling neuroendocrine cancer. And like anyone who receives that cancer diagnosis, you know, it can be devastating. And we'll get into all that. Uh, but uh, life works in mysterious ways. You know, me being at a grocery store the day before Thanksgiving here in San Diego, one of your friends calls me out who's from Chicago visiting in the checkout line, says he's a 16-time Kona finisher. Then we find out a few days later, it's a friend of yours. And Sarah, that was right after we had scheduled this podcast together. Isn't it? I don't know. There, something was in the stars, wasn't it? So crazy. Crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and he was my first Ironman coach. He got me to my first Ironman. He got me my, to my first Kona. Yeah, he's another I, one I, of your I many just, fans. Well, I, it, it's amazing how life works that way. Okay, I am going to jump right in. Okay. You got into triathlon in your 30s. Yep. How and why? Why did you want to do something like swim, bike, and run? So actually I had, I was a horseback rider as a kid and then went to college and started running for fun, came home from college and, you know, started doing, you know, marathons, but no training, no, you know, nothing serious, just the way people used to do it back in the early nineties. Um, and then I met my, he was my boyfriend at the time and he had qualified. I'd watched him go and do Mrs. T's. And at that time you could do Mrs. T's and that would qualify you for Kona, which now, as everybody knows, you have to do an Ironman to get to the Ironman. But back then mm -hmm. that was a seven or a Olympic distance and he was super fast and whatever. And if you finished in the top, blah, 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 you got to go to Kona. 
So we were dating and he said, would you like to come to Kona? And I was like, sure. What the heck? So that was the <laughs> first time I heard your voice. And then that was in 1997, 1997. And I went and watched that. And I had like through the process had kind of like been observing him. And I thought, this is weird. Like, well, this guy had biked for a hundred miles and then he, he's like demanding that he go on a 15 minute run. I'm like, seriously, like the hundred miles today wasn't enough. So I thought it was like compulsive and weird, but I was like, okay, you know, I kind of get it. Cause I ran ma- marathons and then we go to Kona and I thought a lot about this. I volunteered, which I loved, handed out the bikes. Mm. I loved it. And then I remember at the end of the race, standing at, at the finish and they would the guys would be walking and the women would be walking towards me like I was on the side and I would say like you're not going to morph into something crazy like really you're just staying a regular person like you really just did that and you're just a-okay you're just walking away and I was so just completely amazed by the whole thing and I I thought about it a lot and I think I literally had a love affair with Iron Man. I was so amazed by it. And I don't know why. I, I mean, I, what, I, I didn't know how to swim. I mean, I could run, but not really fast. And I never really ridden any kind of bike. And then um, I felt weird because David and I were just dating. And I thought, you know, I'm just going to ask this guy if he could teach me to swim. And we got home and I asked him and he, he saw me swim once. He's a competitive elite swimmer somebody swim once and he's like you know what i'm gonna find you a swim coach because i don't i just don't think i can do this i was like okay <laughs> and sure <laughs> that, wait wait that that instills a lot of confidence that, <laughs> i know i know so then okay so then i basically i i, I put my mind to it and i learned how to swim and i got he gave me this old bike you know but it it was also foreign to me. Um, and I don't know, I started doing all that short course stuff. I spent one year doing short course. And, and then I said, I think I want to do an Ironman. He was like, okay. And by now he, he decided he liked me. He, he actually loved me and he wanted to marry me. So that was nice. So we were going to get married. We were engaged and it was 1998. And then, so the next year would be 1999 and I did my first Ironman. Um, I first, I did Ironman Canada and then I had in case Ironman Canada didn't work out. I thought to myself, well, I'll have a backup. I'll have Ironman Florida and Ironman Canada worked out. And I still said, I think I want to go do Ironman Florida. And I did it, but I was pretty old then I was 33 and so, oh, oh yeah, thought, you, you well, were, you were, you were, you were ancient then. <laughs> but I was thinking if I get if, if I'm going to have a baby, I better do it. So I had a baby yeah. right away. I got pregnant and had Livy. And then I was like, wow, I really love the baby thing. And so uh, three months later, I was pregnant with Charlie. So I had two babies within a year. And I, I thought, you know what? I think I need to go back to the Ironman thing. I really enjoyed that. And so I did Ironman Wisconsin in 2002 with Livy at, I think it was, would make her, I don't know, almost two and Charlie almost one. So they were one and two. And I did Ironman Wisconsin and qualified for Hawaii with Ron as my coach, the guy that you you met and went to Hawaii. Right. And then that, then I had another baby. And then just from there on, it just kept going and going. I just never stopped. Sarah, I always loved it. When you were, I, I always, I always try to find the points of when, you know, that pivot point, when something happened and when you were in Kona and seeing those athletes walk away and you were just mesmerized by it all. What, what do you think, was there something going on in your life at that time that you needed to have something like Iron Man to give you more fulfillment? Or was it just a revelation of, I want to do this? Um, no, I think I had, I was, I had gotten out of my career. I mean, that's a great question. Actually. I didn't even think about that. I don't know. I mean, I had owned a store in downtown Chicago. We were now engaged. We, you know, we're getting married. Um, 
I don't know. Maybe it was just a new challenge. Yeah, I think it was just the I the challenge of it. And then I guess once I don't know, I've heard so many people speak on your podcast and about all the different, you know, from the Iron Cowboy to the guy with ADD. I mean, ADHD. I I don't know. I I feel as though it just spoke to me. Like for whatever reason, it just it felt like home. I know that sounds so weird, but it's just felt like this place I was so happy and I really at that point you know we were making the transition we moved to a new community I'd lived in the city I'd met a lot of David's friends in the city that were triathletes and I had done workouts and stuff with them now I was moving into a suburb of Chicago and I was alone but I found like the sol- the sol- solace of it and just being alone in the morning that I would force myself get up at three four I didn't care get that workout in before the babies woke up. And I honestly, I, I don't know, but what I do know now is that I believe that that sport and that commitment to that sport and the way my brain and body gelled with that sport created the person that I am because obviously then you know we've gone on to build this business and I've had three children and now I've got this you know whatever diagnosis but I I think that dedication and that commitment to that sport built this strength of this person and then obviously I never really saw it as a community I had met those people in Chicago and that group but once we opened endurance sports in Naperville, um, in the surrounding suburbs, I really then started feeling that sense of community. And I think I always felt the community actually at Ironmans as well, where you felt so many people were like you. And I think when I listened to the podcast, we all, I I don't want to say we're weird, but we're wired a little differently. (laughs) And I do think I do. I mean, in a good way, but I do think when you're at those races that were, you know, at the short course races or anything, you're meeting people that are so similar to you. And it just seems normal. And then the professionals, I mean, especially early on, you know, I really looked up to the professionals and you could see like there's someone like me, you know, I'm okay to be this into this and this focused and I'm, I'm not weird. And well, Sarah, then once, uh, yeah, sorry. I, I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I, I got to go back because I think one of the strongest things I've ever heard of why someone gets into it, you said you felt like you were at home and everybody can relate to that because home is where the heart is. And, and obviously that put you in a place to be able to give you the strength of, of today. And, and, you know, I, I had running stores here in San Diego and getting into business in a passion that you have, it's still a business. Why did you want to go into the retail business, which is the toughest business in the world? Uh, and you got into it with a great triathlon store in, in uh, the suburbs of Chicago. Why did you want to go down the business side of it too? Well, I think what happened uh, honestly is that my, my husband at the time was in the um, banking business. He was, uh, you know, worked for at that point, William Blair. And I think he was just so dissatisfied with his career. And I think Mm. he was struggling and he had done, I think Kona, like at that point, maybe four or five times. And Mm. I, I think, and you, you know, he had a real cycle in his sort of, you know, how he was living year to year. And I think when he was training and focused in Ironman, he was so happy. And when he wasn't, he wasn't as happy. And I think he just sort of, thought, okay, maybe doing this would be great. And he opened retail, a hundred percent retail. Um, and then 2008 and nine came and that was really, really hard on the retail business. So that was really Mm -hmm. more his thing. And I was at home with the babies and doing my competitive thing alone and they hadn't really started a club. And then I started to filter in as, um, Andrew, our youngest went to kindergarten and I started doing a run club. And during this period, that was when coaching was just starting. People were starting to do coaching. And David's like, why don't you get your coaching 
um, licenses and do coaching. And I tried, I tried to do the thing online and I couldn't connect to it. I, I did not like it. But when I started that run club at one of the locations, I thought, oh my God, this is it. Like I had the connection with somebody. I could see somebody. I could see the days they were sad. I could see the days they were strong. And I really connected with that. And by this time I'd done, you know, I was like at 12 and 13 Ironmans and I was totally involved in the sport as far as me. And now I was like, okay, I want to give this gift to somebody else. Like, and so it started with the run club. And then once we realized the retail stuff was tough, David went back to work and I stepped in and really started endurance sports as a triathlon club and all the other stuff, the bike fit, the retail selling bikes, that all became value added. And we had really training facilities with copy trainers. And then we had a swim place and then we did running and run clubs. And there's where I felt this huge passion was really just the idea of helping people and building that community and it was my favorite thing ever how'd you how'd you juggle that with your training and three children because i know the retail business is 24 7 how even though you're passionate about it how'd you juggle that i don't i mean geez well definitely i don't had, know is okay <laughs> well i definitely had great people that worked with me at endure it um and David was definitely helpful as a dad um, until we were actually got divorced. But um, my kids had a lot to do. They were they were really involved too, and you know they, you know I, I that was what you're getting me off track here. But I did notice with a lot of the athletes I coach and that were at Endure It, I would always say like make the family part of it. Set up a family calendar, show, you know, write down the, your workout days and what's hard for you. So they see it and then they write down what they're doing. And it's all part of this family thing. And every, you know, I never thought for one no. minute, as I've got a picture back there um, of my kids, you know, going to every finish line with me. And like, I never thought about not having my kids with me. And a lot of people that I coach and train were like, this is my thing. That's the family. Like they didn't integrate that part. And I really integrated m m that life with my whole family. So I think they felt really part of it. And then I don't, I don't, I mean, as far as day to day, you just get hyper vigilant on how you manage your time. And I right, woke up super right. early. I just was super focused, I guess. I, 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 I'm wholeheartedly a big believer in, getting up for uh, getting up before the next person. Cause you can get more done than that next person. So good for you right. on that. Yeah. I, I, you sent me a photo of, I think it was 2003 when you did Kona and you had two of your children in your arms coming across the finish line. Was that 2003? Yeah, that was, yep. 2003. So, so that it, a beautiful picture. Uh, obviously we had to stop, bringing kids across the finish line because things were happening that weren't so good and right. uh, people falling down and all that good stuff anyway. But that's a beautiful picture. That moment, that moment in your life with two of your three children with you, uh, do you carry that with you every day? The picture or my, just my thoughts about my kids. That moment, that moment. Oh yeah, that moment is everywhere in my. I've got that picture everywhere. It's on my my Facebook. It's in my heart. And yeah, I mean, just all the moments of me cheering for my kids and the, my kids cheering for me. I mean, yeah, I yeah. It's just, hey, hey, it any of your kids gonna do an Ironman? Oh, I can't wait till they hear this podcast. Um, I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> My son last year rode his bike across America for charity. And Come on. I, how, how old is he? He was a junior in college. He's a senior wow. now. The one, the little one in that one picture, the one that was actually in my arms. He, so his name is Charlie. And he, I said, Charlie, do you think that the boys, he did it with his, a couple of his fraternity brothers, the fraternity group. And I said, do you think I could join you on that? He goes, Mom, no parents come on this. And I go, Well, do you think I could? And he goes, Well, let's ask. 
And I said, okay. So we asked and they said, sure. You know, and I picked five days and I rode, you know, 470 miles in five days with the fraternity boys last year. It was a real hoot. That had to be classic. How many, how many of, how many of his friends were on the ride? How many were there? There were 22 kids. And and they all made it. They all did it. They all made it. And you should have seen the bikes they showed up with. Crazy. (laughs) Charlie had a nice, but Charlie probably had the nicest bike there just because I knew what to buy him. But yeah, they started in San Francisco and they ended up in Washington, D.C. on the Capitol, at the Capitol. Ah, that's beautiful. They rode about 100 miles a day. That may be your Ironman athlete. You never know. I know that's well, yeah, that's it. Then I've got, you know, they all swam They're They can sw- swim way better than me. So yeah, I don't know. We'll see. My daughter is loves running. We do um, half marathons together. I just ran a half marathon with my son in Boulder, Charlie, that he did with some of his fraternity brothers too. So yeah, who knows? We'll see. But yeah, they're that's great. fantastic. Yeah. Well, I've always said, you know, uh, Sarah, Actions speak louder than words and all those positive actions that you've, you've, you've put into your life are paying dividends with your children. And there's nothing greater than that in life. So congratulations to you on that. Thank you. Let's jump down the, let's jump down the road of the uh, diagnosis that sucked with neuroendocrine cancer, uh, which I want you to explain to us because, you know, it, it's not a cancer you hear about every day. And, but I, I want you to take, take us back to that moment when the doctor first told you you had cancer. How did you assimilate that? Well, it's weird because, um, you know, I basically went to, I was going to go, I thought it was going to be my 28th or 28th Ironman. I think it was, I thought it was going to be, and that was going to be Waco. And I was doing Augusta right before Waco. And I went, jumped in the water and I just, I mean, basically we started to drown. So they got me out of the water, blah, blah, blah. Fast forward, they thought tachycardia, this, that, and the other thing. Then they're like, oh, maybe she had an allergic reaction to the water or something in there, blah, blah, blah. So we get through that and I come home and a couple, and now I've got Waco a couple of weeks later. And they said, you know, we can't find anything. Like all the testing, I think you're fine. It was a flu. So I started training again. I think I'm going to go to Waco and my son, Andrew comes home. That's my youngest. My other two are at college or my daughter's working in Atlanta. And I say, hey, Andrew, I'm not feeling well. Something's wrong. Like, I can't breathe. It's like through here. And we, I said, take me to the ER. And sure enough, it ends up, you know, uh, I was going septic. So they put those things in your nose mm-hmm. and they drain your body for 24 hours. And then I was in the hospital for seven days and they could not figure out what was wrong. And finally, they figured it out. Um, and I was on like the, I think, ninth day of testing. And it was weird because when they kept saying, we don't know, we don't know, we don't, can't put it together, we can't figure it out. And I have all these other symptoms in my life once we've now got the diagnosis that pointed to the fact that I had this, but like it was so random that it was just hard to pinpoint it. Anyway, it, it turns out he's putting these paddles on my belly and I'm like, well, if you press really hard right here, I'll turn red. And, um, I can make myself turn red. I can, it flushes. And then the guy left the room and he came back and he was just a radiologist. So I always thought with cancer, and I said this in another podcast, I thought, you know, they would call you in and you would sit in a white padded cell and all these doctors would come in and say, we want to talk to you about something. You have cancer. This guy's like, I think you have cancer. I was like, wait, what? (laughs) This can't be true. Like, how is this possible? You know, I was, just about ready to do another Ironman. I thought of myself as the most fit person ever. I mean, I've been healthy. I just, I was totally shocked. But with that, within two weeks, I was um, sent to Northwestern and that became my cancer center. And I had a 12 hour surgery and basically they opened me up and just went haywire, taking all the tumors out of my body from all my female parts, half my colon, my lymph nodes, cleaned out my liver, on both lobes, um, you name it, they did it. And then they stopped. They sewed me up and stopped. And then it was after that, it was just a continual diagnosis. Like I had to go in and get my heart, are the tumors in her heart? They are. 
are the tumors on her inner lung? No, but on the outside, which they had already scratched my lung anyway, so that was fine. My head, yes. My bones, yes. My neck and my spine. It was just this uncovering. Um, and then once we started to look at all the symptoms, it was like, oh, the reason I was getting all those bone fractures, that's why. So things mm -hmm. started to make sense about some of the other health things that I was having and ignoring. So if no one ignore your health, your whispers, don't ignore them. Um, anyway, so uh, it, it was awful. It was horrible. Um, you know, and I, I think the biggest thing in my life is what I've come to realize when I was probably at my lowest was when they said it was stage four and I was driving home from the hospital and I just thought like, I can't do it. There's just no way like there's, I can't, I'm not going to survive this. I, and I called my best friend. We had this talk driving down the highway and I, you know, she talked me through it. I got home and I just was wallowing. Like, I can't, I don't know how I'm going to move forward. And then all of a sudden something how'd you, happened. Sarah, how'd you, how'd you I relate just, that? I just, how'd you relate that news to the kids? Stage oh God. four and your family. Well, the, the initial one, they were, you know, they all knew they were coming home. It was Thanksgiving two years ago. They all came home for the surgery. And then, um, the unfolding of it, I think I just always took the news in stride and just, okay, well, it's there. Okay. Now we go through testing for another month. Okay. It's there. I never was like, oh my God, it's stage four. I just sort of was taking the information as it came and just kept moving forward. And now, you know, and starting to do my treatments and I was just following protocol. But honestly, it was about three or four days after that day where I thought I'm not going to do it. I just said, what are you talking about? Are you kidding? I, I have been yelling and screaming and cheering all these athletes on for all this time and all my passion and all my love about how you move forward and how you one step in front of the other and how you show up. And the same with myself, just this, the way I live my life. And I'm like, that's what you're going to do. You're going to do it that way. And I just, flip the switch. And all of a sudden, it, I mean, believe you me, there's a lot of bad days. There's a ton of tears. There's a lot of times I lay in my bed in the morning and I'm like, oh, this is bad. I'm sad. I'm mad. I'm angry. Then I go, well, you know what? A lot of people have a lot of worse problems and a lot of people have things they have to deal with, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. At least I know what mine are. If you have depression, like severe depression, I mean, you don't know when that's going to hit. I mean, people with diabetes, I, I just run the, the things through my brain of all the other things and all the other stuff people are dealing with. And I go, it's not that bad. I mean, yes, it stinks. And yes, I'm in treatment. And yes, I have side effects and all that stuff. But overall, like, I don't know. I just, I'm living with it and I'm dealing with it every single day. And I don't. How do, I think it is the Iron Man thing. I really believe that that person that was built, that has come out of Iron Man, and I, I've thought about this so much, and I think about it a lot, particularly recently, the person that came out of this Iron Man stuff is the reason why I'm surviving this. And even my doctors are like, I said, well, will I run again? And he's like, Sarah, we don't know, you know, and I, now I've run again. I've swam again. I've biked again. I did two more half Ironmans. I did the Ironman in Tulsa, my slowest Ironman ever, but I still did it. And, you know, maybe I might not be able to do Ironman anymore, but I, I'm doing the half next weekend. So it's, I don't know. It's just something I, I think it built my strength and it's been my mantra for how I've moved forward. It, you did, you, uh, you know, <clears throat> the hard things that people do in their life because they choose to do hard things like train for a triathlon or, you know, do a New York times crossword puzzle, hard things, you know, and, and they seem to be able to mold a character that if something comes along, like what came along with you, you're able to handle it 
Do you believe that uh, your community and your network and your friends have as much to do with that as, as your, your self-confidence and you wanting to battle it? I mean, or did you just really kind of do it all on your own? Let me think. I definitely think that my family, I mean, first of all, my kids are unbelievable. I'm so blessed. And I think that my siblings um, have been amazing. And my best high school friends, where I really, when I was really down, have, you know, they've seen to it that I'm cared for. Um, and my endured community. I think feeling that support around me has helped. But when I think about the way I have marched forward, I think that's me. I think that's really me. I, I'll tell you one other kind of funny story. I, when, when I had my surgery, I said to my doctor, I'm like, do you think there's any chance I could go skiing with my kids in January? And he's like, it's doubtful. You know, he's like, this is a tough surgery. You know, I, I don't know about you getting on an airplane and blah, blah, blah. And, um, we were getting closer to the date and I was doing great. And he's like, yes, you can go on that trip. I was like, great. Cause I had planned it for a year. I was all excited. And, um, so he said, yeah, you can go on the trip. So I get back from the trip and I go to my appointment. He goes, how was the ski trip? And I said, oh my God, it was amazing. I skied every day. He goes, what? I go, I skied every day. He goes, I said, you could go on the ski trip. I didn't say you could <laughs> ski on the ski trip. <laughs> so that just goes for my mental like that. I think that there's just part of me that I don't know. I'm being kinder to myself now and I'm being more gentle, gentle to myself and giving myself more of a pad. But I, I think that the Ironman training and all of that is really created this yeah. strength in me. So you're still going through treatments and everything. Uh, did yeah. they give you, do they give you Sarah uh, prognosis? No. Which sometimes, nope. you know, no, not at all. No. Nope. And I mean, it's, you know, we like, we'll have a good period. We just had a bad period um, a month ago, you know, and now we're still trying to hammer out what's exactly going on. It's going to be, it's managing. So those tumors are all over my body. So it's the chemotherapy or the therapy that I get that goes into my body tells my tumors not to grow. And then in 22 days, they go back in and they give it to me again. And as long as those tumors don't grow, um, then I'm doing okay. So I have to be really, they're not, they can't keep scanning my body every couple of weeks or anything close Mm. to that. So we have to just be really careful about like any side effects that I'm having and, and issues that I'm having. And I have to, you know, that's where with me, I'll be like, Oh, I'm fine. I'm fine. Now I go, no, I'm not fine. There's something going on. And then it could be, Oh, well that might be happening because of a tumor or that might be a side effect of the medicine, or that might be a side effect still when you have half your colon taken out and all the other things that they took out of me, my gallbladder and all the other stuff. I mean, my body is still learning how to digest food and do all that differently. Um, So it's just kind of always, I'm in sort of always in management mode, but nothing, it's nothing crazy. I mean, it's really, honestly, it's, you know, it's, I just will keep going through it. Right. Sarah, what, what if you hadn't found triathlon and that world and what it's done for you, what do you think your life would look like now if you didn't have that background well, that's of what I, I was in thinking life? about that too. When I was also listening to your other podcaster that about with the ADHD, I was thinking, you know, I mean, I'm wired with a lot of energy and I've always had a lot of energy. And I think it, you know, when people say, oh, well, you know, did you know she wakes up at four and double, you know, people might not understand it, (laughs) but it's, I, I've always said I'm happier in motion. I'm, I'm, I'm just a happier person in motion. And I think 
triathlon was like this thing that came into my life that took up all that stuff inside of me, all that animation and all that energy. It, it, it gave me a place to plant it. Um, so if triathlon hadn't come along, and I don't think there's a better sport to teach you mental strength, you know, dedication. I mean, it, it teaches you so many basic skills um, that that I've used in my life. But if it hadn't come along, you know, I probably would be involved in something else that took up a lot of energy. Um, I mean, I would have to. I, I, I just think that just is sort of who I am. That's, that, that's who you are, right? I've got a little post-it up here that I've always had because I heard it years ago about, it said, being in motion is your best medication. Yeah. And I think that's worked well for you, huh? Yeah. Yep. And I don't <laughs> I think that's that. why I think, I do believe that really with this whole, I mean, I don't, diagnosis, or even if I didn't have this diagnosis, the way to me getting through anything is by being in motion. How do you handle the ups and downs of the mental strain? Some days you have your moments and something hits you hard upside the head and then the next day it's okay. And then the day after that, it's not so good. Riding a roller coaster is tough. You know, people want to be on that level, even keel. So how do you deal with that, the ups and downs of your life, especially on the mental side? Um. I think a lot of what you say is, you know, just starting your day with something hard, you know, getting out there and get getting moving. And like you said, now, OK, maybe it's not a tough bike and then a run or a big, long swim or whatever. It could be just getting up. And I have two French bulldogs who I love mm. so much. It's getting <laughs> up and getting dressed and bundling up in the cold weather, or, you know, putting on some fun shorts and just heading on a great dog walk for an hour and a half with my dog. Um, but I think it's that thing of getting going. I mean, I know we keep going back to that. And then once I get going, everything feels better. I mean, you, I don't get stuck. Like I don't, I don't get stuck. I just, yeah, it's the hand I was dealt. You don't, I mean, you, you don't let yourself get stuck. That's the no, key. No, no, I don't. And I think also I am really lucky. I am so lucky. Like I, like you brought up my kids. I'm so, I'm so lucky. I have great friends. I have a great community. I found a sport I love. Um, yeah. If someone came to you and they just received a very tough diagnosis on the medical side. What would be your first of a bit of advice to them, Sarah? Oh my gosh. I, um, I, I, as you know, I think it was a great question when you said, is it me or is it the community? Is it the people around you or is it you that are getting you through this? I would probably have to do a little bit of tough love on them and say, cause you do now here, cancer is rampant. I mean, it's everywhere. And so are a lot of other diseases. Um, I mean, all these food diseases and all this stuff, these, you know, irritable bowel and all these things are awful Crohn's. Um, but honestly, I, I think I would have to say like, you, what you're going to have to really look inside of you and you're going to have to pull from you. No one's going to do this for you. And I, that's something I learned also in my coaching that a reason why, which was really painful was the first thing the doctor said is you've come out of a pandemic with your business, smash and grab supply chain issues and Endurance has gone through a lot of stress and you've been ultimately very stressed by it. And we closed Endurance dirt sports as the brick and mortar. We still have the club, but not nearly as formal as it was. And that's sort of, um, yeah, so we're just keeping that as sort of a, a raft over here for me, but it's mm -hmm. not um, really a big focus. Um, but yeah, I think you, I think it's, 
turning inward and saying, um, oh, and one, okay, back to the endurance thing. I think that a lot of my coaching style and a lot of my thing was, and a lot of problem with it was 80% of it was me wanting things. I wanted them to hear your voice so badly that I would do anything to get my athletes. I mean, I was up every morning and riding and biking and we did camps, you know, from Wisconsin to California and solving. We had a camp there every year for 13 years. I mean, just, I was so dedicated to wanting them to hear your voice. Cause I was like, if they can hear that once, they're never going to, that's like their life is going to be changed forever. Or even if they did a 5k or a 10k or whatever, I just, I, I wanted it so much for people. And I think it took so much out of me. And so they're like, now that 80% has to be for you. You have to, that you're going to have to cut that. So in closing endure it, that was probably like one of the hardest things, but I think Tough. that in that process, I think it is about, you have to figure your, your strength out. And I would just have to say, like, do everything in your, whether you get therapy, you know, whether you find, you know, a sport or an activity that also helps balance you. Oh my God, you're going to have bad days. You're going to be so sad. It's going to be so, you know, frustrating, but you're going to get through it. Um, And I think also a lot of the energy goes to your wellness. I mean, a lot of it is about having a plan and I have so many doctor's appointments and I have to be at the doctor for this. And, you know, once you have that in place, it's sort of like a training plan too. I mean, you've got a lot going on as far as managing your health. So I think that, unfortunately, I don't think you can turn to the outside world and think that they're going to save you. I think you have to really ultimately pull from your inside and save yourself. I don't know if that sounds awful, but I think that's true. No, that's it. it the words to the wise. Was there someone in your life that gave you that tough love, or did Sarah Fix give it to herself? I gave it to myself. I mean, I'd never, we have no cancer in my family. Um, I've never had someone with an illness like this. So, um, and my mom is has to mention out there didn't have like my mom to kind of get me through this. My dad has passed. So, and my siblings are all healthy. So I didn't have somebody that said anything like this. I just think I came to a point where I'm people, you just, I mean, and I can't stand around waiting for somebody or anybody to like help me feel better for the rest of my life. I mean, this is Mm -hmm. the rest of my life. I have to do this. It's sort of like you have to do your own Ironman training. I can't do it for you. It's the same thing. It's, it's you know, it, it is that. You're, you're definitely in the rest of your life, which I, I think is bright and beautiful. Sarah, one of the last questions I ask on Find Your Finish Line comes out of the, I've got friends that race the Baja 1000 down in Baja, California in their trucks and all that good stuff. And I've done that and done that too. They sit around the table afterwards. They call it table racing. They reminisce about the event or something that happened. So I call this portion Try Table Racing, where you reminisce with us about an event you did, a moment during an event, something funny, something sad. So whatever comes to your mind, reminisce and try table race with us. Oh my gosh. Um, let me think. <laughs> Well, I think it's, I do think the one I play back the most is, I mean, that I think I sent you the one from, oh no, I maybe I sent it to Dave. So in the year I had your, that, that May one in um, Texas was 2018. Mm-hmm. And that was a good race. Like I, I think I was second in my age group and then four or five months, whatever that is in November. I went to do Ironman Florida and it's I'm coming across the finish line and I come around the corner and my daughter and my niece and my friend are there and they're all screaming age group champion. And I get to them and you can hear your voice in the background. You're just, you know, cheering every person in and um, they start shaking me and they're like, you're, you know, you beat your age group by like 15 minutes or something. And I was 10th female overall, but I was also 53 years old. So that was mm. in 2018. And then uh, that led me to Kona and I went to Kona 
in 2019 and then we had the pandemic. But yeah, that was probably one of my favorite moments. I don't know. That was such a great finish. And I don't know. I was just super proud of myself. Um, well, I, 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 you know, and, and having yeah. a great moment like that with the family there, even yeah, makes it even brighter. So that's, yeah. uh, that's a beautiful, thanks for sharing that with us. That's, that's perfect. Sarah, how does somebody find you or are you still coaching online? Yeah, I still coach through training peaks. Um, okay. you know, and I think yeah. how can they find, how can they find you and connect with you and all that good stuff? It's Sarah J fix at hotmail.com or you can, you know, you can Google endure it E N D U R E it sports. Um, and I, I still come up under that. Um, and under training peaks as well. Well, I, I, good luck with your upcoming 70.3. Uh, okay. I think you're going to kill it. You know, you're going to be down yeah. there with the BCC crew. Uh, Maybe, maybe I'll say, I'll give you $25 for every BCC guy you beat. You know? <laughs> I know Dave will get a, get a kick out of that. <laughs> so you have, you have fun down there. And thanks for sharing with us. I'm, you know, sometimes speaking with people is the best therapy and, and uh, your messages are powerful and, and hopefully they'll help a lot of others on a journey that, it's kind of a winding road journey that they, they don't want to be on, but they're going to keep pushing through it. So thank you for your right. time on that. Oh, thank you for having me. You're welcome. Happy holidays, all that good stuff. To you too. And uh, uh, we'll be in touch. You need anything at all? Yep. Just let me know, okay? You're the best. <laughs> You're the best. <laughs> and thank, thank you, you so again, much. everybody, for listening to another edition of Find Your Finish Line. Remember, if you want that personal Mike Riley recording, go to MikeRiley.net. And uh, I'll record for your family and friends for the holidays. Take care of yourselves. Always remember, you know, if you keep those experiences in your life as positive as you can, you will always find your finish line. Aloha and happy holidays, everyone.